BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Today we're going to be going back to 2007 to be discussing an event that became known as the Knoxville Nightmare. In January of 2007, we saw the murders of two individuals named Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom. This is a case we've mentioned once before on the channel. We did an upload called The Execution of Lamericus Davidson. And Lamericus Davidson is known as the ringleader in the murders of Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom. And we really shouldn't say murders because it's the torture slayings of these two individuals that happened back in January of 2007. And I'm going to include a link to that in the description box here. The best way you can support this channel is just by listening to some more of our content. But in the execution of Lamericus Davidson, we talked more about some of the social aspects of the case. It was very general, even just questioning the nature of the death penalty and what do other media sources have to say about that. So once again, our upload on the execution of Lamericus Davidson is available in the description box here. Now, to talk more about the events that happened in the Knoxville nightmare, in January of 2007, Jan and Christian and Christopher Newsom were abducted after a botched carjacking attempt. They were taken into a home, and over a period of two days, they were raped, tortured, even set on fire. Christopher Newsom's body was thrown in front of the train tracks and left there. And then Shannon Christian was thrown into garbage bags and taken out and thrown out just like the morning garbage. You might have heard one thing about this. If you look into some other sources, you might hear that um, one of the bodies was thrown into the ocean. But that is a popular, um, I guess you'd say, misconception about the case. There was a popular video that was talking about that that had been up for quite a few years. And the perpetrators in this one were Latalvis Cobbins, Lamericus Davidson, George Thomas, Eric Boyd, and Vanessa Coleman. Vanessa Coleman was the only female perpetrator in this crime. Now, the reason why I wanted to do a larger segment about this was the Knoxville News Sentinel was all over this case. They were covering it up and down, and their stuff is available on YouTube for free. And what I did what wanted to do was every single day, I wanted to listen to another segment about the trials, about the legal proceedings, about the coverage in the, well, in the murder trials of people like Lamericus Davidson, the ringleader, as well as some of the other individuals involved with this. I would say that if you want to hear something about this case, the Knoxville nightmare, the murders of Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom, the most valuable one that I heard was the testimony of Latalvis Cobbins. It's available here on YouTube. Latalvis, L-E-T-A-L-V-I-S, Latalvis Cobbins. And he gives about a 40-minute presentation talking about what happened and the murders and, and and so on. And what I would say about this one is he gives some very precise details, such as Shannon Christian was tied up in the house in Knoxville, Tennessee, and she was tied to bags of weights, like what, the way he described it, a duffel bag that was filled with weights and her hands are tied behind her back. And when we mentioned that there were accusations of rape and sexual assault. Latelvis Cobbins mentions that he even participated in the rape of Shannon Christian by telling her if she performed oral sex on him, then he would let her go. So she did that. And then he ejaculated all over her body and then decided to just leave her there. That's the nutshell version. And then I really have to say, though, the forensic investigators in this case were on top of things. We mentioned these two people were abducted. Both Shannon and Christopher were beaten, raped, tortured, and murdered. And then we said that Shannon Christian was thrown out in a trash bag. The ringleader, Lamericus Davidson, grabbed the trash bag with his bare hands and carried it out. And when I said the forensic investigators were on top of things, they were even able to determine that that trash bag had been touched by Lamericus Davidson. That was his palm print, but it was a lifting a trash bag that would have had the weight equal to Shannon Christian's body. That is like some very, very impressive stuff from the from the forensic investigators. They were very precise about who that whose hand it was and how much weight was in the bag, meaning that Lamericus Davidson had to have known everything. You can't play any type of 
any type of uh, defense saying that you just didn't know what was going on. And in short, the legal proceedings carried on for years. I mean, I just saw a video clip from nine months ago when Lamericus Davidson was trying to say that he or his lawyers, of course, are trying to say that he wasn't fairly represented in the trial, that there were errors in the trial. But yes, indeed, Lamericus Davidson was convicted. The ringleader was sentenced to death. Latavis Cobbins was sentenced to life in prison. I believe the events um, connected to one of the other perpetrators in this one, Eric Boyd, are still unfolding. I saw some very recent news coverage about that. Now, some of the things, though, that go that have been said about this, and I want to be very clear, these are rumors that they're talking about, about Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom, that they went to this rough part of town to buy drugs. And some people are saying these things online, particularly in comment sections, saying like, what are these people doing going into the rough part of town anyway? What are they doing buying drugs? What are they doing interacting with dangerous people anyway? Like, what are they doing being in that dangerous place? And in all seriousness, that is no justification for rape or for murder, or to be carjacked even. I mean, yes, of course, you want to try and take care of yourself, but even if someone does get into the situation, you cannot play the blame the victim card. It is purely inappropriate, especially when you're just going off of online rumors. And you, were, you will really see a lot of people saying different things about this case if you look more into it, the murders of Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom from back in 2007, because some of the things that we mentioned in the execution of Lamericus Davidson episode was that the mainstream media really did not want to talk about this case. There was just silence around it. And it wasn't until there was this type of counter coverage going on from various news agencies saying, hey, are, there, are people only not mentioning this because the victims were white and the perpetrators were black? I mean, if the perpetrators had been had been white and the victims were black, then they would want to talk about it. Or they're number one, if anything, they're just trying to say the mainstream media loves to race bait. So, I mean, you could even just as easily say that the people who are doing the counter coverage are waiting for the race baiting moment. But at the same time, it's like the mainstream media did not want to discuss this, this case at first. And a lot of people do believe that that's the reason because they thought that that angle wouldn't be very attractive, that that particular angle would not be something that a lot of people would want to hear about. But right now, what I would like to say is that um, Latalvis Cobbins was on the stand, and he's giving his side of the story. And he 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 shared much more details, as we said. He participated in the oral rape of Shannon Christian. He also lied to her about saying that if she performed oral sex on him, that he would let her go. But he withheld all of that information from the beginning because I think that there's something very valuable in what Latalvis Cobbins shared. When you see people on crime shows or even just daytime talk all shows like Steve Wilkos or The Maury Show, and people are accusing them of things, but they're so adamant and passionate uh, that they are telling the truth, even though there is evidence that is showing that they are lying. How exactly does that thought process unfold? And one of the perpetrators in this case, Latalvis Cobbins, broke it down very easily. He said when he was initially questioned by the police, he told them the truth, but only bits and pieces of the truth. He said that very frequently during his testimony. He's like, I told them the truth, but just bits and pieces of the truth. He would tell them about the murders, but he withheld all of the parts in which he was guilty of something or in which he was involved of something. And once again, I would highly recommend that video, the testimony of Latalvis Cobbins that is put up by the Knoxville News Sentinel. But it really is showing, once you can see, that I think people do this all the time. What they like to do is they have a few control points. They like to hold on to certain pieces of facts like, oh, I wasn't present at that time, or this one single thing you're accusing me of is not what I did. I may have done four out of five of the things you're accusing me of, but uh, this fifth one here, nope, I didn't do that. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I'm not guilty. I didn't do that one. The other four things, yeah, I did, but I don't want to talk about those right now. Once again, they're giving bits and pieces of the truth, but they're never giving the full truth. And this is what you can see very frequently especially when you have defendants that are using stories that are changing, especially when you're using 
or you're dealing with defendants that are not being consistent with their with the with the events that are going on. I think that is a very common manipulation tactic that is used by a lot of people in the true crime world. Or I mean, when I say true crime world, us, we are the viewers and we are listening to what they have to say. And this is how we learn about it. We hear that they're giving bits and pieces of the truth. Four out of the five things they're accused of might be true. And they really want to harper down on that fifth thing that is false and be like, hey, look, I'm innocent and here's why. But then they're ignoring all the things that they did. Right now, I would like to jump over to uh, KnoxNews.com for an article that is going to help us out. And they're going to be talking about Shannon Christian was a 21-year-old University of Tennessee student, and her boyfriend was Christopher Newsom. They were heading out to a friend's birthday party on the night of January 6, 2007, when they were ambushed and carjacked in the parking lot of a Knoxville apartment complex off of Washington Pike. They were taken to, into a Christian, and they were taken in Christians, Shannon Christians, Toyota 4Runner to a rental house on Chipman Street in East Knoxville, where the group's ringleader, Lamericus Davidson, lived. And about Lamericus Davidson, during the trial, they really tried to change his image. They were putting him in sweaters. They cut his hair and they put him in a pair of glasses. This is done by lawyers and consultants. And people are even discussing this in the comments section of the other media coverage from Lamericus Davidson. They're just saying that, look how... He appears when he doesn't have the team of lawyers dressing him up. He's just like very rough and ragged. And you can definitely see that they try to use appearances to persuade people. Both the victims, Christian and Newsom, were beaten, raped and tortured. Newsom was executed within a few hours of the abduction and his body was set on fire. Christian is believed to have been held captive in, in the small Chipman Street house for another 24 hours, during which he was repeatedly assaulted. Now, if I recall what they said about this during some of this um, coverage from the Knoxville News Sentinel, that they executed um, Christopher Newsom um, very quickly because they believed that he just wasn't useful to them. They wanted to keep Shannon Christian there to once again sexually assault her further, or they just thought that he was so insignificant. They had no use for the guy. So that's why he was killed very quickly. It's absolutely disgusting and heinous stuff, but I mean, that is the explanation that has been provided. Ultimately, Shannon Christian was wrapped in garbage bags and stuffed inside a trash can and left slowly to die, suffocating. Five people were charged and convicted. Lamericus Davidson was a known drug dealer who was on parole for carjacking at the time and is believed to have concocted the initial plan to carjack someone for money. He enlisted his brother, Latalvis Cobbins, who was visiting from Kentucky. Cobbins friend George Thomas and Davidson's partner in crime, Eric Boyd were involved with the plan. And as we said, I believe Eric Boyd is still undergoing some legal proceedings for this. Lamericus Davidson, Latalvis Cobbins, and Thomas were all convicted in the state court for murders and rapes. Davidson was sentenced to death. Cobbins is serving life without parole. And Thomas will not be eligible for parole for 120 years. Prosecutors have long said that they did not have enough evidence to link Eric Boyd to the slayings. He was convicted in federal court, however, of harboring Lamericus Davidson afterward and currently is serving an 18 year prison sentence. But once again, the events with um, Eric Boyd are still unfolding and we might find some changes in the tri changes in the sentence and the prison term of Eric Boyd in the future. Also convicted as an accessory was Latalvis Cobbins girlfriend, Vanessa Coleman. She is serving 35 years in prison. Once again, Vanessa Coleman was the only female perpetrator in this. Now, there was a scandal involving one of the judges in the case. And let's hear more about that. Knox County Criminal Court Judge. Richard Bumgartner presided over the initial trials in 2009. In 2011, he resigned and pled guilty to official misconduct for buying pain pills from a felon on probation in his court. After it was revealed that Bumgartner had been snorting painkillers on the bench and holding court while high, defendants in several high-profile cases won new trials, including Thomas and Coleman. You really have to wonder about the credibility of that judge. And can you just imagine somebody getting off because the judge was high. And think about what we have said. People who are raped, tortured, murdered, set on fire. In some of the news coverage, though, I definitely remember hearing that uh, Christopher Newsom was raped himself by the men. I mean, I don't hear that uh, detail expressed very frequently in all of the news coverage. But I mean, I have heard it from time to time in some of these things that have been put out on the Internet. And um, I can't even tell you the specific clips, but I definitely heard that Christopher Newsom was raped and Shannon Christian 
was raped. They were both murdered. Christopher was thrown in front of the train tracks, and Shannon Christian was thrown out in a garbage bag. In the garbage bag is what killed her. She died from suffocation. And can you imagine somebody getting off because a judge was high on pain pills, which thankfully that has not happened yet. But as you heard the things about new trials and new, new, new trials for Vanessa Coleman, the convictions against Lamericus Davidson and Cobbins were ultimately allowed to stand due to the forensic evidence against them. And as we said, Lamericus Davidson's palm print on the bag and meaning that he had to have carried it out with the weight of Shannon Christian's body in there. I don't know how they would ever be able to say that he did not murder her. I mean, he's carrying her out. And bear in mind, the suffocation is what killed her. She was still alive when she was carrying out. He had to have known that he was carrying a human body. Disgusting. The case was steeped in racial tension. The victims were white and the suspects were black. Conservative commentators, white supremacists, and others raised questions early on about why the five suspects were not being charged with a hate crime. Mainstream news outlets, including the Knoxville News Sentinel, were accused of racial bias in their coverage. I have to say, though, the Knoxville News Sentinel has countless pieces of coverage about this, though. Um, I really wish they didn't have this line about white supremacists raising questions. I mean, the fact of the matter is, many places like CNN did not want to talk about they did not want to talk about this case. And um, I don't really think I think that this uh, when they're writing things like that in this particular article, they are almost missing the point, And they're also doing a disservice to the well, to the case in itself. Once again, they're just trying to throw some other things out there to stir up controversy. And the whole point was that. People thought the story wasn't controversial, so they didn't want to cover it. The whole point is you don't have to only cover stories if they're controversial. I mean, what about hearing about the truth? I mean, does that does the, does the truth count for anything to the media players? And prosecutors insisted that there was no indication that Shannon Christian and Newsom had been targeted because of their race. Absolutely, I don't I don't see why they would have, as we said. Um, I mean, Lamericus Davidson was planning a carjacking. If anything, he just thought that they were in a vulnerable position. And I mean, as the article says, they were on the way to a party. But there is this rumor going around that they were in that part of town because they wanted to buy drugs, even if they were in that town to, because they wanted to buy drugs. Irrelevant. I mean, like I heard this on an episode from the Lord and Arts channel where they said that one in nine people in America has done some form of an illegal drug. If you know more than nine people in your social circle, you know someone who does illegal drugs. Those are your friends and family members. They don't deserve to be ridiculed in this way. And they definitely deserve, don't deserve just to become the, the subject of internet gossip. The controversy prompted two downtown protests within a month of each other in 2007 by white supremacist groups. There we go. Back to that again. Don't even need to read that part. In 2013, Christian's parents, Dina and Gary, and Newsom's parents, Hugh and Mary, appeared on right-wing pundit show Glenn Beck's online show. Right-wing pundit Glenn Beck's online show to revisit the story. I mean, first of all, Glenn Beck isn't even super right-wing. Glenn Beck is more of a whack job, and he's in his own little world. I mean... Can we just stop the politics for a second? The Shannon Christian Act was a piece of legislation that they tried to pass, and that puts new restrictions on what criminal defendants and their attorneys can do in trying to portray a victim in a negative light before a jury. A lot of people have uh, made some comments about this in various different things on this channel, various different aspects of true crime. They're like, why are people allowed to shame the victims? They even talk about this in the movie Cape Fear, like if you ever get to watch that one, I've only seen the uh, Robert De Niro one, not the Robert Mitchum one, but they even just want to say that they, there's a possible way that someone can win a case by slandering the the victim involved in a rape trial. And they're just like, how are people allowed to get away with us about trying to destroy the victim's character? And when you heard what we said about how people are spreading these rumors online about one of the reasons why they were going to that part of town. But the Shannon Christian Act puts new restrictions on what criminal defense, criminal defendants and their attorneys can do in the 
portrayal of a victim in a negative light. I repeat, in a vi- of a victim in a negative light. This law is similar to the longstanding rule that prevents prosecutors from bringing up a defendant's previous crimes in an effort to prejudice a jury. And in all seriousness, I mean, if just because someone has committed a crime in the past, it does not mean that they are guilty of the one that they're currently being tried for. During the trial, Americus Davidson claimed the couple had come to his house to buy drugs. There we go. Conversely, jurors were not allowed to hear about his previous carjacking convictions. Well, once again, I mean, the forensic evidence should should convict him alone. I mean, that's all they would really need. And there's another piece of legislation that passed called the Christopher Newsom Act or the Chris Newsom Act, which revises the rules for a judge as acting as a 13th juror at the conclusion of a trial. And um, that even is ties into the Bumgartner drug scandal. OK, and I would like to thank Hayes Hickman for this article, once again, from KnoxNews.com, written by Hayes Hickman. Hayes Hickman in 2018. If you'd like to uh, know more about this case, I highly recommend the videos that are available from the Knoxville News Sentinel here on YouTube. They just have hours and hours of material about the case, especially the testimony of Latalvis Cobbins, because not only does he talk about this case, but he also talks about how how people present themselves when they're being questioned by the police. If you have anything to say at all about anything we've talked about in this one, please drop something in the comments section below. And I would love to hear your opinions about this. I would love to hear any sort of insights that you would like to share about the murders of Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom. And that's all for me now. I will see you on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.